Okay, welcome. Welcome to our block leader meeting. I really, really appreciate on behalf of the city of Cupertino that you've made time to come out tonight. This is always a popular event when we invite the sheriff. So uh, we're so appreciative of their time tonight. But we've got a really jam-packed agenda, and so I just wanted to get started on this. Before we open the program, officially what I'd like to do is recognize a few people who are here tonight. We have our council members who've decided to join us, and we appreciate them. Uh, we have Mayor Scharf in the back, Steve Scharf. And Vice Mayor Liang Chow, right over there. And we also have Council Member Rod Sinks. And I don't know if you know this, but the block leader program is folded back under the city manager's office. And I'm really proud to say that. And we have our interim city manager and also public works director who you met in September, Tim Borden, he's in the back. We also have uh, Brian Babcock, our public uh, information officer. Brian, if you would give a wave. And you know, we also have Stephanie Torini, who's my right hand as well. Stephanie in the back, she's our neighbor watch coordinator. Uh, we also have new block leaders, and I, and I can't tell you, every single time we have a meeting, we fold in new leaders all the time, thanks to you and your referrals. So keep that going, and if you would, put your hands up, otherwise I'm going to start naming you, because I know you're here. Thank you. <laughs> we would give a welcome to our brand new block leaders. They're joining us for the very first time at this meeting, so thank you for making time. Uh, before we get started again, uh, if, um, if the mayor, mayor would, Sharf, if you would like to say a few words of, to say hello for a moment, that would be great. I didn't prepare, but since I could give my state of the city speech again. <laughs> Can you get the slides up? No. Just. So a long time ago, I applied to be a block leader. And unfortunately, I didn't get a response, so I decided to become the mayor instead. <clears throat> but I think it was, might be a little less work to be the mayor. So I really appreciate everyone doing the block leader program. It's so important for our city. And the, I think the residents really appreciate everything that you do. Uh, I didn't prepare a speech, so that's all I'm going to say. Just thank you for being here. Bye. Thank you so much. Okay, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about our program tonight and the order that we're going to do it in. Uh, we have Ken Erickson, who's the Citizen Corps Coordinator, who's going to be coming up momentarily. And then right after that, we will have Stephanie Torini give us a quick overview on Neighborhood Watch. And then we're going to bring up the Sheriff's Department because they have, uh, Captain Arena is going to have a whole lot to say uh, with all the toys that he brought, and then as well as his team that we are thankful are here tonight. Uh, incidentally, well, just to let you know that we love to be able to seat you in zones, reporting zones, and Ken will be able to go over that in more detail. But if you're not sitting in your reporting zone, that is totally okay. We know that you have friends across town, and it just makes it a little easier if you're sitting in your zone so you know who lives in, in the basic area so that's why we like to do that and if you followed us over the years there are times especially during our appreciation event that we don't have you sitting in reporting zones it's open seating and then everybody is kind of lost like oh you know what do i do now so anyway um please meet your neighbors uh, i wanted to also let you know that we have maps up and they're the exact same maps we have three of them around the room we are updating our information, and over the years, as we've, we've um, met and you've done your block leader duties, 
and gone door to door, some of, your, uh, some of the parcels, the homes that you've connected with may have changed. So we wanna make sure that we capture the most updated information. Please feel free to mark up those maps. They're there for that use, and I have Sharpie pens around them. So before you leave at the end of the day, make sure that you do that. Uh, I will also uh, let you know that we have a couple more meetings coming up, and uh, we are going to be doing a new block leader orientation in March, March 27th. So if you have friends across town, once again, please let them know that we're gonna have new training and we'd love to loop them in every time. We're, it, it just keeps growing. So I'll give you information about that. And then we will gather again in May, May 9th, for our annual block leader appreciation. So I just wanted to throw that all at you before you get other information. So thank you for that. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ken Erickson. All right, sorry, getting organized here. Good evening, my name is Ken Erickson and I live in zone one over the Monta Vista Fire Station. And uh, I grew up here. So I went to Cupertino High School and, uh, and have stayed here pretty much my whole life. And uh, so I've got a daughter that goes to Monta Vista High School and uh, then my wife and I, we live over there in, in a organized neighborhood in Danzo Oaks. And I think our block leaders are here we got a little, there we go. Thank you very much. We got 212 units over there in our complex. And uh, I wanted to say to the block leaders, thank you very, very much. Um, one of the most important things that you can do as far as emergency preparedness and uh, is getting to know your neighbors. And if you look at your maps and each other and what you've done to connect with your community in case something happens, in an emergency, but also just on a day-to-day -day basis, what you do is phenomenal. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, what I wanted to talk about it, um, just for a little bit here is, is if there is an emergency, what do we do? Um, you are the people that have the connection to the community. You see each other. You know what's going on in your neighborhood. And basically, you, the information you have, we need to know about. And I'll show you why and what we're doing. You have the zone maps and you'll see that around. Please find your zone and update it as Laura had mentioned. But one of the biggest things for us, if you look at it and you squint and you see the yellow, it's about maybe 30% of the city is in an organized neighborhood of block leaders. So as far as the city's position, we would love the whole city to be yellow because what you do is so important. We'd like to have the rest of the uh, city have the same. So the city is divided into six different reporting zones. Make sure I can go. But one of the things, and I think you've all seen this one before, if you've gone through the CERT program, how many people have gone through a CERT class? Perfect, I knew I was speaking to the choir here. So, um, so thank you for doing that. But one of the things is we, we do know that we have specific hazards and risks that are here. And I know that as a community, we try to address that and the city needs to address that. But just basically on a normal day, if something happens, our day-to-day, -day, our response, who's called 911 and how long did it take you to get the sheriff or a fire department? Just. Okay, we got three minutes. So on a day-to-day -day basis, that's pretty much how we operate. Our sheriff and the fire department, the ambulance services, those people are amazing in what they do and how they support us. And one of the things that happens in a large regional event, like an earthquake or something, is the people that are supporting us with that day-to-day -day service when we call the 911 get to be very busy. And so for us, that call might take a long time. If you were in 1989 in the Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, all of the resources that were available were um, out and dispatched within 30 seconds. So if you called at 32 seconds, 
you may not have anybody come to you for a while. So everybody realized you needed to be able to take care of yourself in your neighborhoods, and what you do allows that to happen. But first of all, we've all been trained, you take care of yourself, your family, and then your neighbors. And hopefully we can do that and be safe at doing it. So there's some specific trainings and things that we offer that are all free, and we'll kind of go over some of that. But for us, you are the eyes and ears. And I think you've heard that phrase before as the community in your neighborhood. You, you do that on a day-to-day -day basis with Neighborhood Watch. You watch out for different things in the um, neighborhoods, but also in an emergency mode, which is quite unusual, but you've already established that relationship and you can look and tell what's normal, what's not normal, where you need assistance, who's there, who should be there, who might need additional assistance. And so we re really rely on the, the employees, if it's during the day, about what's going on in the city. Beyond that, it's us, the residents, because everybody is busy, so we need to be able to take care of each other. So the block leaders, Neighborhood Watch, and then the Citizen Corps are all volunteers. These are all our neighbors that are doing the same thing all across the city, and you can see the, the uh, markings on the map that um, are there, and they see what's going on in the neighborhoods. Oop. Did I get that? There we go. But one of the things we need to know, if something is going on and what's happening out in the city, we've uh, got five different categories of things that we need to know about. And if there's no 911 call or you can't get through for a particular period of time, the things that we need to know about are, are there any injuries in your neighborhood? any life-threatening ones, ones that might need medical att attention, or ones that you can take care of yourself, you know, the minor ones. So we do those. Also been able to look at structures. Is your neighborhood safe? Are there light, moderate, or heavy damage? And we also have, you know, training to go through and tell you how do you assess that. And, and those are all free, and they offer, we offer them three or four times throughout the year. And and the other is, are there any fires? And hopefully everybody's been trained on using fire extinguishers and the utilities, so you'll be able to reduce those hazards. But um, the other hazards that we have in the neighborhoods, if we can find out about what's the status of the utilities, gas, water, sewer, and then specifically in your neighborhood, since we're gonna send resources into your neighborhood, are there any particular access issues that we need to know about? So there's basically five categories that we're trying to collect, and you are the prime candidates to be able to get that information quickly. Um, it's pretty much the first group that gets the information in, gets the resources, is pretty much how it goes. And if we can't hear from, or we don't hear from a particular area or a neighborhood, we'll have to send out people to do that same assessment that you do and you know, but we don't know the neighborhood as well as you do. So it'll take a lot longer. So what we've done is we've uh, set up a, uh, a way of reporting. So this is a soft copy spreadsheet that we use and Laura's got this available so you can download it and use it. But it goes through and it's, I don't know, it's pretty hard to see. But when you get over there on the table, there's a handout package so you can see a hard copy of it and what it does, but um, in there we're collecting by street address, so you can pre-populate the street address and the street name and collect if there's any injuries, any structural issues, any of hazards that need to be done or access issues. And then if you could go to where our ARC reporting zones are, the people, your neighbors that have gone uh, through additional training have stepped forward and said that they will go to these different sites and be able to collect the information that you have, okay? So when you show up, this happens to be at De Anza on the De Anza campus over by the baseball field. Over there, when you show up, you'll find a little placard like this that's on the outside of each container of your arc. Okay, and it has the specific things to do, all right? So the uh, responding volunteers that would be there would be able to follow this and 
get you started. So if you come in and you've got your neighborhood status report, we would be able to collect that and assimilate those things back and get it back to the city so we can get the city manager a good picture of what's going on in our neighborhoods. All right, so that is so important initially to understand what's going on. In our city, after an emergency, one of the things that happens is most of the information about the situation or the status of what's going on with um, all of our utilities, all of our roads, all of the uh, infrastructure and support types of things, all that information is pretty much leaving the city, okay, and going to the headquarters of where they are. And that's just what it is. And so we realize that we need to come up with a plan and that's where this came in to be, where we collect those from each neighborhood, what's going on on these five different criteria and we use the same throughout the whole city. So when we're comparing is the west side of the city, the east side of the city that needs to be addressed, we now have the information about where and who needs it and how do we get that. So it's really important uh, to be able to do that but for us, as you start doing that, it's really important because your safety is, there you go, that's it. And in order for you to do that, you're walking around your neighborhood and things might be a little bit different. So we want you to understand how to do it safely so nobody uh, creates any additional injuries or issues or what you're doing is in an organized manner so that you would be able to, um, do it safely for yourself and your family. So that's where we offer a variety of uh, preparedness classes. And I think you as leaders and in your neighborhoods, uh, we do have, and there's a handout over here that talks about uh, the personal emergency preparedness class that we offer for everybody. We offer it now every month. Okay, so here it is with some dates on it. It's in the parks and rec catalog. So we're able to see, you able to, recommend because you want all of your neighbors to be safe and to have the things that they need to be able to take care of themselves and their family so that they can help in the neighborhood and check. Um, but one of the things I've seen and I've been really fortunate to go to the, some of the block parties is at each neighborhood block party, the group gets together and they decide on where they're all gonna meet. So that's one of the most important things. So you take care of yourself, your family, your neighbors, and you go out and now you share the information and it says, are you okay? Are we okay? Have you seen so-and-so? You know, oh, they're on vacation. This person is over here. Well, I know they just broke their leg and they might need additional help. We'll go check and find out. But you start doing that and you start taking care of each other. And that's what we do as, as a community, our neighbors, okay? So that's what we offer and we wanna be able to make sure everybody does that. But if you want to get more involved or do something else, throughout the year we have different things that'll teach you how to do the injury assessments. What is, um, you know, an immediate injury? What is delayed? What is minor? Or if you're going to do structure, how do you assess that? And that's something that we do in these trainings throughout the year so that you can pick up the different pieces that you can bring back and bring a couple neighbors that you have, or you maybe have talked to your neighbor and a couple people say, you know, I'm kind of interested in what do we do? Or where do we meet? So it's good. Let's get you into the, uh, the emergency preparedness class for you and your family. And then let's get it so that we all start sharing that information and um, be able to be stronger in our community. So if something happens, we can take care of each other, okay? The other part of it, this is something that, um, you as leaders is um, the city is going through an update of the emergency operations plan and in that that whole process that's where it starts defining what are the roles and responsibilities throughout the city for different types of hazards and things the director of the emergency operations center is our city manager okay so our emergency plan is one for the community and so when we do that we need to be able to reach out to the community and get your input on these different things. So we don't want to build this plan and response without addressing everybody that needs to be included in that. So it's a whole community kind of approach. 
but it's really important for you to, to know what's going on. It's coming up. You'll hear about it. And um, you as leaders, as you go back to your neighborhood, hopefully it'll be the talk of the town. You know, Cupertino's doing the emergency plan. Have you heard about that? Okay. But those are some of the things that I would like to share with you. And what you're doing in your neighborhoods is amazing. And thank you. And keep it up. And let's keep it all connected. And hopefully the yellow keeps growing throughout the city. That's our, our goal. Okay. Any questions or anything for me? I appreciate it. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Does this work? There we go. Yeah, the question was, is there any, informa any way for the city to get information out to you? Uh, the primary uh, mode that we would be using for the city is to use our city AM radio, 1670 AM. All right, so hopefully everybody's got that plugged into their dial and listen to it every day. And every once in a while, we get the person behind the curtain's voice on there. You can hear them say different announcements. But that is how we would be able to get initial information out to you over the radio. Um, other modes that we would use would be um, outreach through the alert notification system that we use in the city, alert SCC. So I think you've seen different messages and hopefully you're all signed up for that. But those are the ty types of things. And then um, Brian Babcock is our public information officer and that would be coordinated through the, his office on what information, how that gets done and goes out. Maybe, Brian, you have something else to say how you do that? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Laura. All right, thanks, Ken. <laughs> Handouts are up front, so on your way out, please be sure to pick, pick them up. Next, we have our Neighborhood Watch Coordinator, Stephanie Torini, and many of you know her. Round of applause for Stephanie Torini. <laughs> Hillary, this is it. Thank you guys again so much for coming tonight. It's always great to see you. This is the, one of those nights I really look forward to. With Lauren, working with you guys and the block leaders and a lot of our neighborhood watch leaders and block leaders kind of blend. Um, we still have some that are one or the other. So I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about the neighborhood watch. If you guys wanna do a meeting, I'm not gonna get into the other stuff because we have like the rock stars here that will do that. <laughs> so basically, if you're interested in doing a neighborhood watch meeting, just you know, send me an email, uh, give me a call. Um, what will happen is that if you um, or your neighborhood is interested, I'll come out to your neighborhood. You guys will give me a couple dates that work for you guys. Um, it could be on the weekends. It can be during the week. Um, in the evenings, just, you know, whatever works for you guys. And you're never going to get 100% of your neighbors together. So whatever works for the bulk of you. And, you know, we might have to do more than one meeting. We've done that before with other neighbors where they've said, you know, I can get some neighbors this night and we can get some more this night so we'll do it that way so the key thing about the neighborhood watch program is like being block leaders you want to get your neighbors to know each other you know the more that you get to know each other the better quality of life you have in your neighborhood and you start looking out for each other so the neighborhood watch component is going to be the prevention so it's where we come out and kind of give you guys some tips about what to do to reduce potential crime in your neighborhood, okay? Um, after I do the presentation, um, the Sheriff's Department um, usually comes by, and if you would like to have them over, usually it's the deputy working in that area or the on-duty sergeant will come by, and they'll pretty much reinforce what I just said, <laughs> and then they'll give you anything updated information or questions you might have about current things in Cupertino that are happening. Um, so it's whatever works. I've done neighborhood watch meetings in people's homes. I've done them in the driveways. I've done them in people's backyards, carports, cabana clubs. I've done them at baseball fields and the bleachers. Whatever works for you guys, whatever you're comfortable in your neighborhood to do, that works. Um, sometimes I've had people do a block party and maybe they don't want the full presentation so they'll ask me to come out maybe for about 20 minutes or half an hour and just do a little summary of what's going on or address certain issues that you might be having. If it's something that's out of my um, zone, then we reach out to the Sheriff's Department and then they can come and they can be the rock stars they are and, and do what they do. But that being said, um, I just want to take a minute to 
segue over to the sheriff's department. Did you want to come say something? Or I just want to say before Laura comes up is that these guys are awesome. I mean, I have been doing the Neighborhood Watch program for 14 years, 15 years, I don't know, I lose count. But anyways, I have never been to an event, a Neighborhood Watch meeting where I've heard anything negative about our deputies working in Cupertino. Um, that's amazing, that's, that's pretty cool, you know, to hear that. And the support that you guys, that these people have for you and the appreciation is just phenomenal. And I just thank you guys for what you do for our community here and our residents in Cupertino. They really appreciate what you guys do, so. Thank you, and of course we have to add to that, right, Stephanie? Uh, we would love to be able to have all the deputies come forward. Uh, we have a little gift on behalf of the Block Leader Program and um, homemade treats that Stephanie baked herself. So uh, <laughs> she should do it for all of us, right? Homemade treats for all of us. But anyway, if you would please come forward, we would love to present you with a little, little something. And I'm sorry, Dutch, Dutch can't have any of this. <laughs> Officer Dutch. Okay, in the moment we've been waiting for, um, Captain Rich Arena. I contacted him in September and always without hesitation, he says, oh yeah, I love the block leaders. And so we've had this date on our calendar for quite some time. And, uh, and as you know, the block leaders love to get updates and we ask them back every year and they respond. So thank you so much, we appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, how are we doing today? This is great, I got some presents, some gifts. You haven't even seen my presentation yet, and I already got some gifts, that's great. I think we can wrap this up now, we can get out of here. <laughs> hello, hello. This works as well? Yeah. Okay. Well, Laura, thank you very much for allowing us to be here today. Uh, we sincerely want to thank you, Stephanie, and the city of Cupertino for giving us the opportunity to really to be here today to talk with our residents about public safety. Um, one of the things that we enjoy is being able to communicate directly with our residents, being able to understand some of the problems that you see in your neighborhood, right? Now, I'm gonna ask this question, and I want everybody to raise their hand who's done this, okay? You see a suspicious person or vehicle or something that's unusual in your neighborhood, that kinda, kinda makes you think, is this suspicious in nature? Is this something that I should call the sheriff's office for? Who's done that? Excellent. So I would say about 40% of the people in this room. And that is exactly what we need you to do. And so our presentation here today is gonna be really a summary of last year. It's gonna give you a good picture of what happened last year and certainly what areas we need to work on, right? Because let's be honest, 
our goal, I know it's my goal, I know it's the sheriff's goal, is to be the safest city in the nation, right? That's our goal. We wanna make sure we're as safe as we can be. And so what that means to us is there's some work we need to do, right? And I say us, but I really mean collectively us, the entire community. So uh, before I get into my presentation, I do wanna recognize my staff that's here. Uh, to my left here is Sergeant uh, Brown. He is our administrative sergeant. Next to him, we have Sergeant Post. He's our swing shift sergeant. He's on duty right now. And you're gonna hear from these two gentlemen in a little while, but we have Deputy Lira. And Deputy Lau. They, they both work in a special assignment, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little while here. And then we have Deputy Keck and Dutch uh, sitting on the table there, in the table. <laughs> so here's our agenda for the day and I hope to make this interesting but I will say this is there is a lot of data here you're gonna hear a lot of things this entire presentation will be available for you at a later time okay because I recognize how much information is on here I understand this is extremely important and so certainly I want you to take your time to look at it to see what time of day we're getting some of these uh, burglaries occurring, uh, what locations. I want you guys to pay attention to the times. And certainly, you know, having this kind of presentation here, um, I think you kind of miss that. So certainly it'll be available for you at a later time. Our agenda today is crime updates. We're gonna talk about, again, what happened last year. We're gonna look at um, what things we can certainly do better. We're gonna look at home and vehicle burglaries. And I will tell you this, I'm not proud to say this, but we have seen an increase in our vehicle burglaries in the city of Cupertino, uh, that it's, it's a 10 year high at this point. This is something that we've seen in the entire region. So it's not just unique to the city of Cupertino, we've seen this in other cities as well. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about why that's occurring. And again, what we can do as a community to work on this problem. Because I think again, it's, it's not, something that we can solve ourselves. It's something that collectively I think we can certainly make a dent. And our goal for this next year, this year, is to reduce this number you're gonna see here. Package thefts, we're gonna talk a little bit about package thefts. Um, the correlation between a package theft, mail theft, and ID theft. Because, you'll see in, in a second, ID theft is again, uh, one of those categories that is just increasing year over year. And again, it's, it's not just Cupertino, it's the entire region. We're seeing people that are stealing mail, stealing packages, and unfortunately creating false accounts and taking our information. And I say our information because guess what? <laughs> I've been a victim of ID theft, yeah. People open up accounts in my name, yeah, it's happened to me too. Uh, we're gonna, again, introduce uh, the, uh, Deputy Lau and Deputy Lira here, and they're gonna talk a little bit about our special assignment that we have in the city of Cupertino and, and what essentially what they're geared for, what they're trying to prevent. And then, and then we'll talk to Dutch, see if he's willing to say a couple of words. <laughs> okay, well let's get started. Commercial burglary, so here's, here's a snapshot of our city uh, for the last two years. I'll step out of the way. So when we look at the statistics, what we're looking at here is data that we've compiled, right? So this information you're gonna see is raw data. This, I have an analyst in the office. All she does is combs through all our data. She physically looks at these reports, tabulates the data. So this is gonna be a little bit different, this data, than you're gonna see, for those of you that are familiar with the UCR report, it's a uniform crime report. Uh, that is put out by uh, the FBI, and essentially what that is, is crime data that's uh, categorized differently. And so what we're gonna show you here today is really the, 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 the raw data, the exact numbers that we have in our system that is probably the best data you're gonna get, in my opinion. I shouldn't say probably, I know it's the best data. So commercial burglaries, we saw a 7% increase this last year. 
These are uh, burglaries that are occurring in our shopping centers inside one of the businesses, uh, whether it's at nighttime, during the day. These are people that are going in with the intent to steal something. Residential burglaries. We did see a small increase uh, in 2018 compared to 2017, a 7% increase. Uh, if we compare 2018 to 2016, and you'll see the graph here in a second, we did really well again. 2016 was a bad year, um, and again, we'll see that in just a second. And here is the big number, our vehicle burglaries. We did see 11% increase, 330 this past year. Compare that to 298, um, yeah, and that continues to grow. We're looking at a lot of data to determine exactly where these are occurring. Um, and our intent is to communicate with our shopping centers and see if we can collaborate with trying to reduce these numbers. Uh, auto theft, we see a 15% increase. That is, so we had 60 in 2018 and we had 52 in 2017. Auto thefts are people taking our vehicles, right? And so what we've seen is somewhat of a unique way that our, our vehicles are being stolen. And it, let me share that experience with you because it's starting to increase in numbers. So many of us have vehicles that have what we call a fob, right? Everybody know what a fob is? So what we are doing is, yes, I will say we because I've done it a few times. I stopped doing it. But what we do is we drive our cars into our garage, right? And we'll leave this fob because we don't need this to be plugged into anything. It just needs to be inside the car, right? Somewhere near the car, I should say. And so what we're doing is we're driving our cars into our garage, we're driving the cars in front of our house, we're leaving the key fob somewhere around the car or near the car, right? And so what we're seeing is, unfortunately, it is juveniles, young adults. What they're doing is they're going into the cars that are unlocked or hitting the, the locks to see if it unlocks by itself and then just hitting the button in the car. You go in the car, you hit the button, and if it starts, they know that this is somewhere in the car and they're going to drive away. And so we're seeing a lot of that. And so if you do have one of these fobs, our recommendation is to make sure you don't leave it near the car unless you're in the car, right? Take it in the house, right? So we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, grand theft, these are uh, thefts that are, have occurred uh, of a value of over $950. So we do have some expensive bicycles out there that have been stolen and fall into this category. Some electronic equipment that's been stolen. Identity theft, again, the correlation between identity theft and mail theft, package theft. So we have seen an increase, 4%. Robberies, we saw a drop on robberies. And just so, so I can paint that picture really quickly, a robbery is something that occurs, it's a theft, but it's a personal crime, right? So the difference between a burglary and a robbery, a robbery is somebody stealing something from me using either force or fear. So it's a personal crime. It's something that we don't see a lot of in Cupertino, clearly, but it does happen. And a lot of times what happens is somebody will approach one of our residents and say, give me your purse or I'll hurt you. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm afraid of that. I'm certainly going to give you my purse. Uh, and so that classifies that as a robbery. It's, it's a more personal crime. A burglary, on the other hand, would be if somebody went into your car, took your property, somebody went into your house, took your property, and never really confronted you. And so the robberies are something that we look at every year to make sure that they're not something that we need to address. And certainly this year, a lot, this past year was, was a good year for us. Assaults, uh, a decrease, 11%. Domestic violence, 3% decrease. And then our sex crimes, 14% uh, increase. And these sex crimes can range from uh, some type of allegation of a rape to uh, some kind of allegation of being touched inappropriately. And what I can tell you is these, all these assault, the sex crimes are between people that have known each other. So these aren't sex crimes where it's this unknown person that you know jumps one of our residents and then commits some kind of heinous sex crime. This is really people that knew each other at some point and there's allegations of an assault. And certainly we investigate those no matter what type of assault they're, they're reporting. So. Okay, as I mentioned, so this is another way to look at our data. And so what you'll see, and I apologize if you can't see it in the back, uh, but what you'll see is, and we're gonna talk about this, is the increase there 
so the, the black is 2016. So if you look at the black charts, what you'll see is that just about every category um, it is, there seems to be an increase there. So you look at commercial burglaries, residential burglaries, vehicle burglaries, again, that's something we've seen year over year increase. Auto theft was an increase, ground theft. So if you look at 2018, which is the orange, um, we did okay. We did okay last year. Certainly area for us to improve on, but we did okay. So robberies. I talked about robberies. I talked about what they are, how they're committed, um, and how we always pay attention to these because this is, I mean, if you can imagine, this is certainly a very traumatic experience. Somebody wants something from me, and they're going to force it away from me, or they're going to point something and try to hurt me because they want what I have, right? I mean, that to us, that's a serious crime. And so what we saw this past year is the following. So we have bank robberies. We, we did have three, right? Uh, demand or fear, that's where somebody says, give me your purse, give me your phone, or I'm going to hurt you. Saw three of those. Home invasions, that's when somebody forces their way into your home and tries to hurt you, tries to demand that you give them something or you're going to get hurt. We didn't see any this past year. Pharmacy takeovers. Hmm. Yeah, we're seeing an increase in this as well in the region. And what this is, is unfortunately, uh, crooks know that there's a lot of value in some of the medicine that we, that we have in our city. And so what they do is they'll go to stores, jump the counter, grab some of the medicine that's behind the counter, and then the store employee will try to confront that person because it's our natural instinct. It's like, oh, what are you doing? You can't, you know. And so that actually considers it a robbery because there's that force. That person's trying to stop the, the person from taking the item, and the suspects are forcing their way out of there. We're seeing a, a small increase in that uh, regionally as well. And then shoplifter versus security guard, that's when a uh, security guard tries to stop a shop, shoplifter, and then they fight a little bit. They get pushed. Uh, snatch and grab, uh, I talked about that. That's somebody who just runs up to you, pushes you, and takes your purse or takes your iPhone or your laptop. What you'll see on the right is, is the weapons involved. So we had, uh, I would say one, maybe two, where we had an actual weapon. Uh, and I believe it was the bank robbery we had on De Anza um, that the person went in there, uh, brandished a weapon, a firearm, and robbed the bank. Other than that, we, we didn't see any. And you'll see to the right there where it says uh, weapons involved. No, the majority of these, uh, we didn't see uh, any weapons. The location, business, 92% of the time. So these are occurring in our business centers. Uh, residential was 8% of the time. So it's still a big number, but if you compare that to 92, that should be telling us as a community that we really got to be vigilant when we're going to our shopping centers. Right? We're coming out of our shopping centers, when we're going into our shopping centers. You know, I'm not saying your head should be on a, a swivel or anything like that, but you certainly want to pay attention to your surroundings. Where did you park? Who's next to you? Take a glance around as you're walking in. Make sure that your bag, your purse is not just hanging out here somewhere. You put it close to your body. How am I doing on time? Okay. <laughs> Residential burglaries. This is a big topic for us. This is one of the categories that we continuously try to reduce year over year. And I was a little disappointed this year uh, because we um, had 122. Last year we had 114, which was really good last year. Uh, but then you see that, that trend, right? So you ha that's a 10-year comparison there. So if you look to the left, 2009, and where we're at now, 2018, it looks like it peaked in, in 15, 16. There certainly was an increase in 2000. 13, and it kind of leveled off a little bit, came back down. We're doing okay. We're doing okay. Again, there's a lot more we can do here. And we're going to go over this again in more detail. I'm going to try to take some questions at the end, if that's okay with you. So where are these occurring? 
Well, again, as I mentioned, our analyst does an excellent job of looking at the totality of that crime. Everything from where it happened, the day, the time, putting all this data together so that we can share it with our community and also so we can share it with our staff, right? Our deputies need to know where this stuff is occurring. And so what you'll see here is, and what we're looking really for here is, are patterns, right? I mean, how, how can we stop some of these from occurring? Well, we see kind of where the little lumps, right? The little uh, bunches of, of red homes there or little circles with the home in the middle. And so we know that we need to be kind of in that area. Um, there, but there is no real pattern. If somebody sees a pattern, please let me know. <laughs> right? Oh, I should have asked you guys, what day of the week do you think these things are occurring on, right? So here's, here's the information. Day of the week. Right? Day of the week, Fridays. Any idea why Friday? Payday? Payday for them, right? So they're thinking, well, I'm going to start my weekend. Let me go try to break into a home. And yeah, yeah. And you know what? Uh, I, I can tell you, I can tell you several stories where uh, Sergeant Brown can also share these stories where it's around 11 or 1130 on a Friday. And without skipping a beat, you know, we get a residential burglary and, and there we all, we're all going there trying to find these guys that can lead us in a short pursuit. It's just about like every Friday and so that doesn't surprise me there. Um, so we know, we know that these are occurring on a Friday. I'm going to say that again. We know these are occurring mostly on a Friday. So let's pay attention on Fridays. Um, Saturday and Sunday, th those numbers do surprise me a little bit. I think we're like seven and six, six and seven. They surprised me a little bit because most of the time we're home, right? Most of us are home on Saturday and Sunday. Um, so it is a little surprising that we have, you know, this many. Um, and I know the, the writing's a little small, and as I mentioned before, you can certainly read this. Uh, it'll be provided to you. So how are they getting into our homes, right? That's important. Well, what we know this past year is that 43% of the time, they force kicked or pried, door, pried a door or window. Hmm. 43% of the time. 8% of the time, they broke a window. They broke the rear sliding glass door, 10% open garage door. That means that we left our garage door open. Just Most of the time, it's overnight. But not always. Most of these that we see are overnight. And then we have an open and locked door, open and locked window. So if we look at some of the things we can work on as a community, I would say the open or unlocked window probably could have been lower, the number, right? That's something we can do. We can lock our windows and doors. Uh, the, the garage door, 6%. The door, the window, so that's 20, 33, and 6, 39. 39%, I think we could probably reduce this number by about 39%. Those are things that we can help uh, with, right? My logic, some, you know what? Time of day, right? So, well, this is probably something you would have guessed correctly, and that is we're seeing these between seven and five, right? Seven and five, because again, the crooks, they're not trying to confront us in our homes. What they're trying to do is get in when we're not there and steal from us. That's what they're trying to do. And so certainly they know we go to work between 7 and 5, and that's when they are more likely to, to jump into the house. And so we do have a 35% period where we just don't know. And so this particular area speaks to us going on vacation for let's say a week or two we leave on a friday come back on another friday and then something happened to your house you call us and then we ask you those questions well when did you leave and when did you notice that this occurred and you'll say well we left friday and we came back friday so it might have been somewhere in between so we can't determine exactly which day this occurred early morning uh nine percent in the evening six percent
here's some tips. And these are probably the best tips you're going to hear. If you lock all your doors and windows, we're going out even if it's just for a minute. A lot of us think that, you know, I'm just going to run down to the store for, you know, it's going to take me 10 minutes to just get there and come back. Within those 10 minutes, something can happen. You're making it easy on people. If you have an alarm, use it. If not, consider purchasing an alarm. Unfortunately, the same thing happens with alarms. Ah, it's going to be 10 minutes, 5 minutes. I'm just going to go down the street. And ah, I don't need to turn on my alarm. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, somebody broke into your house during that time you left for that short period of time. And so we, we recognize that. We know that sometimes people are in our neighborhoods watching for things like this when we step out for a minute. And so we're watching, we're trying to find these people that are parked, that are walking in our neighborhood, right? That may look a little suspicious. So that's why I asked that question, how many people have called us when they've seen something suspicious? And certainly we want to encourage that, give us a call. As they say, deputies are standing by. <laughs> uh, make sure you let people know you're home when somebody knocks on your door or rings your doorbell, right? Um, I know I know we have this, this, this feeling of not saying anything when somebody knocks on our door or, or rings our doorbell because we don't want to be confrontational, right? We don't want to say, uh, what do you need? No, no, no. We just don't, ah, why deal with it? Why deal with it, right? I'm letting you know, sometimes people are knocking on your door, ringing your doorbell to see if you're home, right? And so we've seen a handful of these cases um, where young men and women will knock on our doors. We won't say anything. And guess what they do? They try to break into the house. And when they break into the house, we're sitting there watching TV. And we, whoa, this guy, hey, get out of here. And then they run. You guys call us. And then we, we realize that uh, they were knocking on your door just five minutes prior. And so we strongly recommend that if somebody knocks on your door, let them know, no, thank you. We don't need any. However you want to say it politely. Thank you, but we don't need any. Thank you. No, thank you. And they'll move on. Certainly you want to look at you know, who they are if you can, if you have a camera system or if you can peek out the window. Um, and feel free to give us a call as well. Uh, make sure you close our garage doors unless you're in and around your garage. Right? And then up, upon returning home, if you notice a door or window open that wasn't open before or anything unusual, give us a call. Give us a call. Okay, let's talk about vehicle burglaries. Mm. So as I mentioned, now this is an area that we continuously have been working on for the last few years. Um, I don't know exactly why this is occurring. My guess is that the crime itself isn't, um, you know, isn't being prosecuted in a certain way, right? If somebody breaks into my car, um, it's not as severe in terms of punishment if somebody breaks into my house, right? And if you think about the items you have in your car and the items you have in your house, and if you really study which one takes which one gets you more gain for less time? I think you would kind of see a little pattern there of why this is occurring. Um, and so what's happening here is, is we're seeing this increase again. Uh, it's a 10 year increase, uh, make no mistake. Uh, and so certainly we want to make sure that our residents are aware of this. This is happening and we're going to share some things that we can do collectively again to make these numbers go down and also present our team here that's really tasked with trying to reduce these numbers. Yeah, where are they occurring? Hmm. 90, I would say 95 or so, 95%. That's a large number in our shopping districts, 95%. So again, when we're going shopping in town, Let's be a little bit more vigilant. Let's, let's look at the car next to us. Let's, let's pay attention to our surroundings because, well, I don't want to spoil uh, what, what our uh, VATS team guys here are going to say, but people are watching you. People are watching you. Um, if they see you, again, uh, carrying something loose, maybe on your phone, maybe not paying attention, maybe leaving your bag on the trunk of your car while you walk up to the front and, and just not, not really paying a lot of attention, you're really making yourself be a target. Um, and again, we know that the majority of these, 95% or so, are occurring in our shopping centers. 
to this to to us this means we need to be working in our shopping centers law enforcement and we need to get the word out to our residents to make sure that you pay attention to your surroundings in and around our shopping centers here are some of the things we see these guys taking these guys and gals money obviously phones bags purses garage door openers uh, the garage door openers we have had I would say probably four or five where they stole the garage door opener and then later came back and broke into the house so the intent is to take the garage door opener and come back later right so if you ever have your garage door opener missing or you just don't know what what happened to it um, I'd strongly recommend that you uh, reprogram a new one, maybe change the code, uh, maybe contact us to see if we've encountered anything like this in the neighborhood. We can certainly talk to you about that. Uh, but don't leave anything in plain view, right? So it's funny because uh, I've actually seen this where, um, I don't know if it's a trend that's going to continue, but people understand this problem that we're having. Um, I haven't seen it in Cupertino, but uh, and some people will just leave their windows rolled down with the sign that says, help yourself, there's nothing of value in there. <laughs> I've seen this. It's like a white sign, help yourself, nothing of value in there. And you, like, you poke your head and they're like, well, yeah, they're right, there's nothing in there of value. And the point there is, if I have nothing of value in my car and my windows are up, somebody might still think there's something there and break my window, cost me a couple hundred dollars. Eh, I'll leave my windows down, there's nothing of value in there. Um, you know, it'd be good to get that data to, to do kind of a test on that to see if, in fact, that would help, but uh, for, that's for another time. <laughs> and then vehicle breakers, again, uh, do not leave valuables in the vehicle. Uh, a thief will break your window on a chance of something of value is there. Again, any packages, any purses, any containers, anything that is in your car that's visible from the outside can be a target, okay? We have seen, these gentlemen have seen how this happens. And what, you'll, what we have seen and what you'll see is that a car will park, this unknown car is gonna park somewhere, they're gonna be watching the parking lot, there's gonna be a driver there uh, and a passenger, and it's usually two or three people. And so one person to get out of the car and start walking through the vehicles, right, in between cars. And as they're walking, they're looking. They're looking. They're making note of, okay, okay, I see a bag here, a bag there, a bag there. Okay, so out of these eight cars, I see two, maybe three of these cars that have bags in the back. And so what they'll do is they'll come back, they'll double back, they'll break into the first one, grab the bag, break the second one, get back. You're talking about 20, 25 seconds. And then during the time that you're breaking into that first car, the driver's driving out of that stall getting closer to this guy that's taking the bags so that when he's, he or she's done, they could just turn around, jump in a car, and they're gone. And that takes less than a minute. Uh, and so we've seen that. Um, so we caution you on leaving any valuables in the car. Pa package thefts. How are we doing on time? Okay. Package thefts. Um, this is something that, again, there's a correlation between our mail in our package, packages being stolen. Um, people steal our mail so that they can find out who we are, open up accounts, credit card accounts, um, whatever kind of accounts they can to be able to purchase things. And here, here's the bottom line with this. These identity theft, mail theft, package thefts are difficult for us to investigate because it takes a lot of time for us, right? So we have detectives in the office but it does take a while for us to investigate something like this, especially the identity theft portions of this. And they know, the crooks know that. They know that it may take a detective two days to solve one crime, and, and they know that. And so now we have, I don't know, six or eight a week. So if you do the math, there's just no way we can catch up to that. And so we're gonna continue to see an increase on this. Um, but we do have some tips here we're going to share. We shared with the council a couple months ago uh, our top five uh, tips to try to prevent this. Normally, we'll see an increase in mail theft and package thefts during the holidays, right? Starting October, November, December, and that's kind of what our chart shows there. 
that uh, September time frame, I, I don't know what happened then. Um, I don't know why we had such an increase in September of, was that 2018, last year? Is that 16? Yeah, 16. I don't know. Top five package theft prevention tips from us. I'm going to read these. Have a neighbor or relative accept the parcel if you can't be home. Have the packages delivered to your workplace. We have staff at our office that have packages delivered there to the sheriff's office, right? Hey, I don't blame them. Utilize shipping lockers as offered by some companies, right? We got Amazon. We have some of these other companies that have lockers where you can ship stuff to if you're not going to be home. Provide delivery instructions to have the parcel hit in a location that is out of sight, right? Request the shipper hold the package at their facility for you to pick up when convenient. Um, and then you'll see the other tips as well. One of the uh, extremely beneficial tips is called informed delivery. Anybody signed up to, for informed delivery? Excellent. So informed delivery, what that is, you can go to, to ups.com, type in informed delivery. What it is is you'll get your mail uh, scanned, right? And you'll get a, is it an email? It's an email with, with the face of your mail. So you know what to expect, essentially. They're, what they're saying is, hey, this is coming your way. And so you get that, that email, you click on it, you see all the mail you're going to get. Uh, I believe there's a restriction to sizes of packages, but most of the you know, standard mail that we get gets scanned. And that way you get that email, you're like, okay, I know I'm supposed to get eight of these pieces of mail. And you, know, you go to your mailbox, there's nothing there for two days. You're thinking, ooh, yeah, maybe I got, maybe somebody took advantage of me there, right? Uh, informed delivery. So now uh, I'd like to introduce our burglary and theft suppression team here. We have Deputy Lau uh, and Deputy Lira who are going to talk to you a little bit about what they see out there. And these two gentlemen, uh, we won't tell you what they drive because that defeats the purpose, right? I can see you guys going to the shopping center and, hey, that's, those are the guys Captain Urena was talking about, right? It's like, no, 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 okay. Uh, but they're going to tell you a little bit of what they, about what they see out there when they're parked watching our shopping centers, right? Gentlemen, if you can stand on this side. I think the, yeah. uh, my name is Deputy Lara, this is Deputy Lau. We are the 2019 burglary suppression team. So like he said, we're out there in unmarked cars. We try to rotate intentionally. As you can see, we get to dress a little more comfortable. That way you don't see us as law enforcement out there because we are sitting and watching. So the reason why we're out there, so this is the fifth year I believe we've done this. Theft, particularly vehicle theft, is now a very organized crime. So it's not your neighbors that are breaking into your car. These are burglary crews that come from outside the area. And it's really a crime of opportunity. They go into, you could see the trends, what he showed you. These are the restaurant districts, the retail districts. And they watch you go in. And in Cupertino, particularly, They'll just walk right by your car and 99% of the time it's a laptop bag or a purse just sitting on the seat. So they could be in and out of your car without making any noise and they don't even go in your car anymore. Just five years ago they used to go through, go through your glove box, actually get in the car. Now they just break your window, take the bag and they're gone. So the frustrating part for us is because this is so organized, we have to get creative with it. So we are parked in parking lots watching, waiting for these crews to come in 99% of the times, they're gonna run from us. Because of that, we're really organized and we work with all the other allied agencies around. So if they come to our town and steal out of cars, the next thing they're gonna do is they're gonna go to Mountain View or Sunnyvale or Santa Clara. So we are sharing in real time the information. If somebody comes here and we have a car that we, we see, we're gonna let Mountain View and Sunnyvale know right away. So because of that communication now, we are catching these crews. And what I initially said, they're, they're usually East Bay crews, or they're coming from the Valley, Sacramento, Stockton, those areas. It's hard to catch them, especially in Cupertino. There's no, not a whole lot of street lights. It's very dark. And these parking lots are full of people, full of restaurant patrons. So if one thing we can ask you guys, be vigilant when you're going in there. Try to look around if you see a broken window. Let us know right away, because I take it personally. I know he takes it personally, we all do. We want to catch these guys. I've been a victim of this. I'm sure you have as well. I've had cars stolen, stuff stolen. It's frustrating. So 
again, let's go back to the point. One thing to keep you guys from being a victim is don't leave stuff on the seat. It's so easy for them to break a window and be gone in literally five seconds. And you probably won't even hear it even if you're standing right next to them. The majority of these guys are using um, these glass window punches that um, are sold for emergency purposes to, to be able to um, you know, help people out of cars in an emergency situation. So you, you can buy these uh, window punches for $10 online. So that's what they're using to, it's just a small little pop, you can barely hear it. Um, the majority of these um, vehicle burglaries happen when people just, as I've previously said, um, leave their bags in plain view or even underneath your seat. They'll go in with a flashlight and just take a look real quick and just, you know, take note of all the different cars that have bags in them and then go back and hit each car real quick and be out of there in less than a minute. Um, so definitely keep all your stuff, um, you know, in the trunk. Um, place it in there before you park in the parking lot. That's a good idea. So maybe stop at a shopping center a block or two away and then just uh, put your stuff there then proceed to your actual location. Um, one other trend that we're starting to see now is that um, especially um, people visiting our Apple stores, they're buying high-end electronics and then um, going to dinner or lunch afterwards and leaving electronics in their car. Now these crooks have been um, seen following the people from that particular Apple store just waiting until people um, go eat lunch to break into the cars because they know you came out of, out of the Apple store with a bag or a laptop. So if you're gonna make a high-end purchase, um, just make sure you take it home before you go out and have dinner or lunch or hang out with your friends. Excellent, thank you. And you gentlemen are gonna hang out for a little bit here yeah. in case we have some questions. Uh, I'm told we're gonna have plenty of time for questions, which is great. Um, so last year, this team um, this is a pretty conservative number. It's 75 arrests. 75 people went to jail based on what these gentlemen were doing last year. And so the way, thank you, thank you. And, and, and the way this works, this crime works, is for every one that you, you arrest, you're really arresting this person for about 10 that they've actually completed, right? So. 75 arrests, I can tell you, made a huge impact in our community. And so that is certainly something that we're going to continue to do here for the next few years until we get these numbers down and until we're able to really put a lot of these guys behind bars uh, or at least push them out to some other area. Uh, well, uh, it's that time. We have Deputy Keck and Dutch, um, certainly our favorite team, our favorite duo here. So Deputy Keck will be talking a little bit about what Dutch does. Uh, how he operates, and uh, how old he is. He, what is he, like two years old? Uh, he's getting a little bit older now. He's getting a little <laughs> bit older. Um, so this is, my name's Deputy Keck. I've been assigned here to the West Valley Patrol since January of 2015. Uh, last year, I, I know that I've talked to a bunch of you, but I'll tell all, I'll tell all everybody. Uh, last year, I was fortunate enough to put in for our canine unit, and uh, I got Dutch. Dutch, yes, he, is, he stares at me. Um, Dutch is a Dutch Shepherd. Uh, he is different. He is not a German Shepherd. He's not a Belgian Malinois. He is a Dutch Shepherd. Uh, that is his breed. He has a uh, that nice black brindle coat, which you'd be able to easily recognize any other um, Dutch Shepherd. He, I got him in April. He was about two years old then, so he's coming up on three here in a couple months. Um, we did a bunch of training, which was wonderful, and we've been working out here in Cupertino and the rest of the county since June of last year. Dutch is trained in narcotics detection and patrol, um, and all the patrol duties, whether it be um, apprehension, tracking, uh, location of evidence, and doing different types of uh, searches. So um, with Dutch, we've been fortunate enough to do um, you know, you guys, uh, the residents of Cupertino have been, uh, you know, good enough to help us out to go to different training classes. Uh, we've been able to go to a lot of narcotics training classes and some tracking schools, and a lot of it's been really paying off for us. Um, we've had several, uh, we've assisted um, the Special Operations Division, not only for the Sheriff's Office, but we've worked also with the DEA and San Jose PD of working with their investigations of, and getting some pretty good narcotic seizures. 
Um, Dutch assisted and helped to do a narcotic sniff where they seized 650 pounds of illegal marijuana. And so it sounds, it's a lot, right? Um, what's, and what it's kind of happens with residents is they don't realize that it's happening right next to them. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's a big investigations and the cops come and they're like, oh, wow, I, I had no idea. And so, um, you know, I never really knew how much narcotics is out there until you have a narcotics dog. And then, um, you know, now I have a narcotics dog and he, uh, and it's, I get calls from a lot of people to come help out. And uh, it's, it's really, it's really eye opening. You know, it's, it's everywhere in the, the mail system, the, the airport, it's with your neighbors. So, um, so it's really, it's really awesome to have him and to go out there and uh, try to do good work with that. We've found, we've located good pieces of evidence. We talked about some of these different crimes, whether it be um, some of the robberies, burglaries, and things like that. Um, we've located, there was, a, uh, there was a time where a lady got kidnapped, and we were able to locate a knife that was used during that incident. There was another time where um, deputies tried to stop um, some individuals that were um, committing crimes, and one of them threw a gun, and we were able to locate the gun during an article search. And those are things that um, the deputies, after the fact, you know, they come up to me, because, you know, I always go out there with him, and we just, we just try to do the best we can. And, um, you know, they came up to me after the fact, and, you know, they're just super appreciative. Hey, there's no way we would have found that without him. Um, so canines, canines are invaluable, in my opinion. Not only can the, for all the different things that they can do at work, but I can bring them here and talk to you guys. And it's a really great way to uh, get involved with the community. I know I've seen a bunch of you guys out at the, um, uh, at the national night out, at the different, um, different community events. And so it's really nice to be able to talk to you guys and bring him along um, because, you know, some of the time he just wants to be a big puppy and play. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Cat. I was just afraid of the, how this works with the screen. Okay. So, so one of the things we wanted to do this year is bring some of the tools that we carry in our patrol car, right? How exciting is that to be able to see some of the things that our deputies are carrying in their cars, right? And so we have here to my left, your right, is a table full of items that we carry in our patrol car. Things like an AED. Did everybody know that we carry AEDs now? Narcan, does anybody know what Narcan is? Um, Narcan is something that um, helps opioid overdoses. And so I know you've heard a lot of uh, opioid overdoses stories in, throughout our nation. We're having a problem with that. And so we were able to purchase Narcans for our officers. So in the event that we have to respond to uh, overdoses, we can certainly administer Narcan. And so you can see that to your left there. We also have this uh, tool here called the stop stick. Uh, anybody know what a stop stick is? Anybody watch cops? Anybody see these guys that are trying to stop a car and then you see an officer, you know, somehow get in front of the guy that they're chasing and then they grab this bag and then they throw it on the ground and they run the other way and then the car runs over this thing and the tires inflate? No? no? Okay. <laughs> so so we, have, we have stop sticks here. Uh, so feel free to come over and take a look at them. Um, the bottom line with those is uh, they're what we call uh, pursuit intervention. Uh, it tries to stop the vehicle that we're trying to stop. And so certainly you want to be careful when we use them. Um, they're, they're here, so you can take a look at them. We also have our body-worn cameras. We also have um, our, did we bring the ID? Maybe we, didn't, maybe we didn't bring the ID scanner. So we do have a fingerprint scanner. So if you're trying to tell me who you are and I don't believe you are who you are, we can put your fingerprint in this machine so we can figure out who you are. All right. Uh, we also have a wrap here. So uh, let's say somebody's being somewhat combative, right? They're kicking, they're pushing, they're screaming, they're not, maybe they're under the influence, who knows why. Uh, we certainly don't want to get injured ourselves and we don't want them to get injured. So we have something we call the wrap. And so the way that works is it really 
if you can imagine just being seated on the ground, it ties your feet together and your arms in a humane way, um, just so that nobody gets hurt, and then you're assessed by the, the medical professionals. We have a lot of crime prevention information, and then we also have what we call our less lethal. This is kind of like a bean bag, right? A bean bag, so that in the event that we have to utilize uh, force, uh, we certainly don't want to use deadly force unless we have to, but that less lethal there is uh, something that we carry in our patrol car. So please, uh, at any point here, uh, please feel free to come up, talk to Sergeant Brown, uh, poke around, take a look at some of those items that we carry, uh, because these things are things that um, I can tell you have saved many lives in our profession. And it's always interesting to see what we carry, right? It's like, I wonder what they carry. And this is just a few of the things. I mean, these, the, car, the cars that we have, the items we have in the car, I mean, these things are, there are a lot of them, right? So I'm going to take this opportunity to answer some questions. So I'm going to walk around. If you have a question about anything that I talked about today uh, or some other time in the past, I know there was a question over here, so I certainly want to get to you first. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll walk around. If you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll answer your question. Let, let me get to her first. Okay. I was just going to ask you, you have to show any patterns of location with high crime, any pattern of any location of a kind of higher crime. A patterns of locations in terms of high crime? Um, um, patterns and locations. No, I, I think you saw the kind of the charts there. And what we know is that um, the crime that is occurring, especially in these, these shopping centers, the, the vehicle burglaries are, are being committed in the shopping centers. So those are the patterns. There are times um, that these are occurring. And the times are occurring is in the evening time between 5 and I'd say 10 o'clock at night is when the majority of these are being committed. So that's what? That's dinner time, right? Um, I had a question. Can you explain everything what's on your belt? It's always... Sure. Uh, so she, her question is, can I explain what's on my belt? So to my right here, I have just handcuffs. Uh, to my left is a magazine um, that carries bullets for the firearm that I carry. Um, I have a pepper spray here. It's called OC for us. It's the same thing as pepper spray. And then on my back here is my radio uh, flashlight. And then I have, um, on this side, key holder, right? So my car, my fob. Uh, so that's about it. Pretty basic. How much does it weigh? Good question. I'd say 30 pounds, 20-some pounds. Yeah, the firearm is pretty heavy with, with the bullets. Yeah, so uh, we got to make sure we exercise our back and make sure that, right? Yeah, good question, though. Let me uh, make my way. Let me go here. Rich, I can run a mic oh, back here. Okay, we'll start here and then. Um, would you recommend that we carry with us um, items to protect ourselves, like pepper spray or some other things that you would recommend? That's a good question. So the question is, do I recommend, do we recommend you carry things to protect yourself? Well, here's what I'm going to say is, if you make that decision to purchase something to protect yourself, Make sure you're educated on how to use that item. So if you decide to buy pepper spray, um, please make sure you know how to use it. Don't let any kids around it. Don't let anybody get to it that you know, is not trained to use it. Um, I know some people do, do choose to purchase things to protect themselves. And so our recommendation has always been, if you do decide to buy anything, including a firearm, you have the right to, to, to purchase a firearm, uh, make sure you know how to use it. Make sure that uh, you know how to use it well, and that people that aren't intended to get their hands on it don't get their hands on it. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Do you know how many um, houses or housing units we have in Cupertino to put those numbers in proportion? The housing units? Yeah, so how many households? I don't have that answer. Okay, so when you say so many burglaries, we yeah. don't know what percentage is that of the house. What percentage of the city? Yeah. I don't have that number. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you want me to sit right back here, then I'll move over? A uh, question regarding auto burglaries. So is it true that the, bur the robbers are carrying some kind of uh, device that they check, scan for electronics? Because I don't mm -hmm. think 
they could be checking, finding stuff so quickly to break in? Yeah, so, so I've, I've been asked that question previously. And unless these gentlemen have seen this, so what we're, we're talking about is a, an, an electronic device that is used to scan um, a location, a vehicle, to determine if, 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 if there's an electronic item in the vehicle or, or in the box or in the location or in the vicinity. Have you guys seen any of that? No. I have heard about that question before, but I, we, I don't think we've ever seen anything like that. So, so the majority of people are walking, looking at the cars inside, and then what you're saying is some people are breaking the window simply to pull the back seat down to look in the trunk to see if there's anything there. But some, some machine or mechanism that is able to uh, scan an area to pick up some kind of electronic device, I've heard of that, although I haven't seen that. Here, uh, for identity theft, do you recommend we freeze our credit or use something like LifeLock? So absolutely, I think, I think using a product, a vendor, to monitor your credit's always good. Uh, if you have been a victim of identity theft, you certainly want to follow the procedures that are outlined um, in, I believe it's on our website. If not, if you type in Experian, they, they give you all the, the information. But you certainly could put a hold uh, it's it's a uh, suspension. I forget the terminology they use. A credit freeze. I think it's 90 days. Every 90 days, you you can, yeah. So you can actually go on there and do that if you believe you've been a victim of identity theft. Yeah. Before you become a victim. Okay. Before yeah, absolutely. You have the right to do that. Absolutely. Well, I think you have to look at. Uh, the probabilities, right? Um, and so I would say that if you look at your lifestyle, right, let's say, let's say you have a mailbox that doesn't have a locking mechanism. And let's say you don't collect your mail every, every other day, or, or I'm sorry, every day, and you collect it every other day. And let's say you do a lot of shopping online with credit cards. And let's say you use your, your credit cards a lot. These are all things that are really opening up the door for potential identity theft. And certainly if you're one of these consumers that does things like this, that goes out and uses credit cards for everything, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't see why that wouldn't be a, a bad idea. Um, a lot of us, um, you know, just being diligent in what we do in terms of security, making sure that we pick up our mail every day, that we're doing everything we can, most of the time that's enough. Uh, not always, but most of the time that's enough. So again, that's a decision you'll have to make if you want to do that. Um, to the, to the uh, burglary suppression team, do you guys ever, just curious, if you guys ever um, uh, set up a car, a decoy, set it up, and good, watch? Yeah, good question. So the question is, do you guys ever set up a, like a decoy car so that, you know, you can watch somebody breaking in or anything like that? For, for auto burglaries, we have not. We do that a lot with residential burglaries. So we'll put just a decoy, one of our patrol cars in our neighborhood. The idea with that is just to scare people out of your neighborhood. They'll think we're sitting there. And it works. Um, we have a lot of ideas that we need to iron out for decoys for vehicle burglaries. It's something we have been talking about and would like to do. It, and it, I don't mind sharing this information. We will be doing that this year. <laughs> I, just, I mean, we, that's what he, he was trying not to say, but I can say it. I'm the captain. That's okay. <laughs> We will be doing that. Another question? Okay. Hello, hello. Uh, are the automobile security systems uh, effective in inhibiting break-ins? You know, like a car, KRR system, they have a little light inside so people, professionals can look and see if that light is on and they know that system's inactive, or is active. So are you talking about like a, like a car alarm that has a yes. the LED or some type of light that indicates to someone that there's an alarm inside? If, if the car has been jarred or if the window has been broken and they open the door and they don't have the key with them, mm -hmm. uh, the alarm will go off. So, 
just about anything they do to the car, even though they've broken through and have gotten in, will set off the alarm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anything that you can purchase that will deter somebody from breaking into your house mm -hmm. or your car is going to be an asset. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I, I, how many of us have these these cameras, right, that are on our Oops. rear? Uh, uh, mirror, review mirror, right? That's pointing to the front of our car. How many of us have those? No? Wow. We see them all over the road. Matter of fact, a lot of times uh, when vehicles collide, when we have collisions, right? We have crashes in Cupertino, let's be honest, it happens. A lot of our residents will actually have it recorded because they have these cameras that are mounted to the rear view mirror. And that helps us out, obviously, because we're able to kind of see what happened. But I'm, I'm surprised not a lot of us have these. Uh, they're very inexpensive. They're like $30, $40. Um, and it really paints the picture sometimes when things are happening in front of you. It doesn't capture what happened. Well, there are some to capture inside, but the majority of them just capture outside. Um, I noticed that you said don't keep any identification in the car. What about your car registration? It has your name, your address and you have to have it in the car with you. How do we go around that? That's a that? great question. So here's what we recommend. If you are gonna have your registration in the car, use a marker and just uh, mark out the, the address, right? Because it's gonna, have, it's gonna have your name. It's gonna have your name. Perhaps you can mark out the, the first name, leave the last name, or mark out the, the last name just to have your first name. You can certainly mark out your address, that, that's fine. Or you can carry it on your person, or you can take a photo of it, right? You can take a photo of it, keep it on your phone, and so when the deputy stops you, which shouldn't happen to anyone here, but if it does, <laughs> but if it does, you can say, you know, I don't carry my registration in my car, and I don't want somebody to steal it, but I do have it in my phone, can I show you the photo? Deputies are totally understanding of that, and so that's, that's one way to get around that. Yeah. Um, when, oh, when, uh, when my identity got stolen, so they ordered, the person ordered a credit card in my name, and they, it, the credit card was mailed to that address. So I called, because the bank told me the address, so I called, it was in a different, it was in Central Valley. So I called the, I tried to let them know, I know where this person lives, can someone go there and, you know, and investigate this. I don't do how ag how actively do people actually go after these um, identity theft? It, it, very common, by the way, where somebody steals our identity, they buy things, and they ship it to a different address. If we're, if we're able to get, if we're lucky enough, really, to get that address, um, it is our practice, the sheriff's office, to follow that that lead. Did you call our office? Oh, I was trying to call Central Valley. So okay. Then you will go after yes. You yes. Call us, and we will work with that agency. One of the things we pride ourselves in is the communication we have with other agencies. I can tell you, we work really, really well with the agencies that are surrounding Cupertino, and there are a lot of meetings that are had all the, all the time to talk about some of these patterns, some of these things that are occurring because they're not just occurring in this city; they're occurring in other cities around us, right? So that, that collaboration with other police departments, whether it's San Jose, whether it's Sunnyvale, whether it's Los Altos, uh, Santa Clara, is extremely valuable to us. Uh, and so, bottom line is, if you're ever a, a victim of a crime like this, where you got an address, right, somewhere else, give us a call. We'll, we'll work through that with you. Yeah. was a large sheriff presence and a helicopter circling for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple months before we had a house that was someone tried to break in by kicking the door. So we didn't know as neighbors what was happening. So we didn't know whether to lock our doors. Some people were going out for afternoon walks. Is there mm -hmm. a way for us to get um, information on what is happening at that moment rather than like a few few days later from a neighbor or something so we know what to be aware of and what to do? Yeah, and I think I know the event you were talking about and what I can tell you though without getting into specifics is that incident was essentially a family disturbance. And a lot of times what happens in family disturbances is that it occurs in the house. 
Uh, sometimes it does bleed over to the backyard, side yard, front yard. And uh, family disturbance is something that we don't take lightly because there's a lot of emotions in there. So you'll see typically pretty large presence because we don't want to get hurt. I mean, I, that's the bottom line. We don't want to get hurt and we don't, certainly don't want any residents to get hurt. Um, so to answer your question, uh, two th you could do two things. One is you got to understand though, at, at that particular moment, we're so focused on that incident that all our resources are going to that incident. Right? So what I ask is that you give us a couple of minutes, um, and then if you see a deputy, feel free to ask him. Ask him, ask her. I'm a neighbor, um, should we be concerned? Right? I mean, because that's really what you want to know. And I can tell you we do a pretty good job of, of letting you know when there's something going on um, through reverse 911 or alert SEC, which you should be signing up for, alert SEC. Um, but in the event that we don't, feel free to, again, reach out to one of the deputies there. Um, if for whatever reason there's, there's nobody there and you really want to know what's going on, you could always call our dispatch, 299-2311, 299-2311, that's our non-emergency line, and say, I'm a resident here, can you tell me if we need to be aware of anything, I have my family here, certainly all great questions, questions that you, certainly I would want to know, right, 299-2311 or ask a deputy and they'll let you know. I'm gonna make my way to the back here. I've been ignoring this back area all evening. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> we've heard about taking your address off of any your registration in your car. We've also heard that uh, if you have a GPS system with a map, there's a marker on that says home. Okay, so what we're gonna do, if my blue Forester winds up at your substation. That's my home address. If it's stolen, I like that because we I like we that, live Stan. You're we thinking. live nearby. Stan is thinking, right? So what he's talking about is, is these GPS devices that we purchase. So we type in where we go, and you know you hit a button that says home, and, and it's got your address, so it tells you how to get home. And usually for long trips, that kind of thing. So what he's saying is he's going to put the sheriff's office uh, address on there. So if it gets stolen, they're going to drive to our office. Oh, 1601 South De Anza Boulevard, Cupertino. 1601, right there, actually. Oh, I don't have it up there. 1601 South De Anza. <laughs> yes, sir. We've been talking about uh, true physical things like your house, your car, um, parking lots. Um, I've been getting a lot of offers to uh, transfer two million dollars to my account from my uncle in you know somewhere in the world who I didn't even know I had who has died and left me as a do you do any have anything to do with that type of theft fraud or whatever oh goodness I, I, honestly I had I had three phone calls today on my work phone from somebody on my work, the sheriff's office registered phone. I got three calls today from somebody who was trying to sell me something. Right? It, it was one of these ro robot, co robot, robot calls, right? Um, so the, do we do anything with people that are trying to scam our residents, right? Such a, such a prolific crime right now. There are so many people out there that are trying to convince us that somehow somebody's got some of our money, and if we give them $1,000, we're gonna get two million in return, right? Uh, we, we always, our recommendation is, uh, please, if somebody calls you trying to sell you or try to convince you of A, B, and C, hang up on them, hang up on them, just hang up on them. Um, if you get an email that looks like it's from somebody that you've never heard of, you, you don't know who they are, don't click on it, don't open it. Um, the bottom line is, you know, these crimes are occurring. Some people are taking advantage of our residents. Uh, sometimes, uh, I, I have a recording of one gentleman who called me, right? And he was trying to convince me that there was a, a bug in my computer. And so he, so I said, I said, oh, great. Well, how do I get rid of it? Oh, you know, and he went on to tell me to press um, the Windows icon, and then I think it was delete or something. Of course, I didn't do it, but. So I was trying to engage him in a conversation long enough so I can kind of get an idea as to who this guy is and where he was calling me from. But as far as I got was, he got frustrated, right? Because I was asking questions over and over. 
uh, he hung up on me. But the, far, the, the only thing I can tell you is that it was an international call. So um, if, if people are calling you or people are emailing you, if, if people are saying that they found some of your money somewhere, these are all scams, folks. And please, please don't, don't fall into those scams because they are, they are happening. Other questions? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. is, uh, is there a way to effectively uh, block the robocalls? Because th there are some apps that supposedly will block it. I've just gotten to where I just don't pick up the phone unless I recognize the number, because yeah. most of the calls are robocalls. Does anybody, does anybody know, sorry about that. Does anybody know of how to block these robocalls from coming in? Because um, I. I'd like to know as well. I mean, I'm sure there's a way out there. I don't know the answer to that. What I can tell you is that they keep using different numbers, so it tricks you all the time. But I don't know the answer to that. Uh, oh. We have something on our phone called Nomo Robo. It's free. It's N-O-M-O-R-O-B-O, -O -O, Nomo Robo. And it eliminates some of them, not all. But a lot of them, what will happen is on my phone it will say call, incoming call and it will never ring because it's been removed. So no more robo. No more robo. <laughs> yes. I, I recently heard a lot of like a vehicle burglaries in the shopping plaza of Blaney and the Bollinger. So is there anything particular to that plaza, the vehicle burglary? That Walgreens Plaza, like a uh, Bollinger and Blandney. Pacific Rim? Uh, we, yeah. we call burglary. Yeah. Uh, Bollinger and uh, uh, Bollinger and the Blandney. That's, yeah, Blandney. That's Pacific Rim Shopping yeah, yeah, Center, Pacific, right? Yeah, Pacific Yeah, exactly. Pacific Rim Shopping Center. Um, we, ha we did have, I think it was six mm -hmm. last week, gents. I think it was last week or the week before. Um, that is an area we are targeting because we are seeing a, a slight increase and vehicle burglaries there. So if you do, you know, I'll say this for all the shopping centers. If you go to any of the shopping centers again, please be vigilant. Don't leave anything, anything of value in the car, right? Uh, but we, how should I say this? How should I say it? I'll give it up. We have been monitoring that shopping center. <laughs> We've been watching people. Matter of fact, did we end up making an arrest out there? Yeah, we, on Tuesday we made an arrest there. Uh, we arrested, I think it was, yeah, one person, yes, yeah. So, again, we're, we're watching, we're watching you, we're watching people, um, but certainly help us out by not leaving anything of value in, in your car. Hi, I wonder if you, um, if you know, if, like, if people have a dog in the house, if they still break in? How many houses that were broken in that there is a dog in the house? Yeah, that's absolutely, that's absolutely a good prevention tool, a dog. Um, I have a little rat terrier, um, and if you knock on my door, you're going to think that there's a 200-pound German Shepherd on the other side, <laughs> and I can tell you that if my dog sees you, my dog's going to run the other way, <laughs> but the crooks don't know that, so, oh, we're recording this, now they know that. Anyways, um, dogs are great, great uh, tools to use to prevent burglaries. Yes. Do they check for home? Oh, okay. The statistically, you know, I don't think any of the, the homes that were broken into actually had dogs in them. In other words, um, not that I'm aware. Gents, are you aware of any of the burglaries having a pet, a dog? In, I'm not aware of any of them. The numbers that you saw here? Uh, Deputy, Deputy Kick remembers one. So that's actually pretty good. What kind of dog was that? What kind of dog was that? <laughs> this one here? This one here? Dutch? Dutch? Oh, do you remember the dog? Medium-sized dog. So they, threw, they distracted the dog, right? That's not fair. I mean, they threw food so the dog can go to one way so that they can go the other way. 
One more question? I have one more question. We would certainly want you to come and see our table here and be able to see all the different things we carry in our patrol cars. Uh, we have plenty of deputies here who can certainly answer your questions just as well as I can, probably better. And so the last question will go to Two questions. We got two, la two more questions here oh, and here. Okay. Nice to see you, Officer Oh, yes. yes, as you mentioned, the, the city of Cooper Tindall is dark. Do you think it is helpful with build up the monitor at our street, but on both ends? It's helpful to catch the safety or burglary safety. Lighting? Uh, lighting? Like the monitor, just monitor the lighting too. So are you saying that it's the helpful. lighting, if we had more lighting? Also light monitor. Lighting and the monitor. Oh, like the camera? Like the yes. Camera? Usually the monitor, any camera is helpful. We can make, can we build by ourselves? Do you think so? Right, so so I think I, I think I understand what you're two, asking. Two, two things, one is. Light. Is lighting, you're saying. Lighting. If Another the streets one. were a little brighter, would that help reduce some crime? Yeah. And then the other thing you're saying is. Also set up the monitor or the like cameras, camera. Like cameras, license yeah. plate readers, that kind of technology where it records yeah, yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, Com yeah, computer. Right? Yeah, well here's what I could tell you with that question is, certainly if the city of Cupertino yeah. would want to, you know, uh, erect some of these cameras, that's certainly a conversation we can have. Yeah, um, look, as far like as it preventing- Each of our house has the camera, yes, arrow, yes. something. And that's, yeah, that's certainly something that I recommend. If, if you have an alarm system at home, folks, uh, and you don't have a video surveillance capability to it, it's probably time to get a new one, uh, because video surveillance certainly helps. And um, if, if we have the majority of our neighbors equipped with these cameras, and guess what? When something happens, you'll see us asking every neighbor for some footage, and that certainly does help. Um, you can certainly point it at the street, right? You can point it at the driveway, your driveway, and capture the street there. I don't necessarily recommend pointing it at your neighbor's house, <laughs> but if you do that, I just ask that you speak to your neighbor first, because uh, that, believe it or not, that does happen. And the last question, yes. We live in a neighborhood, you know, where we have like 400 houses. So let's say a burglary, robbery, something happened. There is there a way to know that it happened and where where did it happen? So you're asking if some a crime occurs in a neighborhood, is there yeah. a way to find out where you get that yeah. information? So certainly we provide the information to the city of Cupertino on a weekly basis. So if you sign up to receive the updates, Laura, is that that's an update that somebody sent, Stephanie sends out? Yeah, the crime report, the, the crime, Stephanie? How do they the receive the updates on crimes that happen weekly? I'm blank. You need to be on this, this is recorded. No problem, so, so you can go to the city of Cupertino's website and there will be links there for you to be able to access the data as to what, what occurred the previous week. But you could also go to crimereports.com, uh, type in all the information there, and then be able to see what's going on in your neighborhood. And please, if you have any questions, any of, the, any of your groups, any of your neighborhoods, if you have any questions about anything we just talked about today, anything that's occurred in the past, feel free to give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. We have plenty of our staff members here today. Certainly, they're well aware of what's going on in the city of Cupertino. And the last thing I want to say is thank you very much. Thank you all very much for the work that you do to being part of this community that is second to none. Uh, it is really you guys that's making a difference in this city. You guys are the ones that are out there helping us out. And I think together we made a significant difference this last year. But I ask you for a little bit more help, right? A little bit more help. For that 40% of us that called 911 on a suspicious circumstance, next year or the year after that, I want to see at least 80%, 8 out of 10 of you guys, right? And you, I guess what you'll see, I'm sure you'll see this, is a decrease in these numbers. With that being said, thank you very much for coming out here, and we'll be here for, a few, for about an hour. Okay, so before you leave, Couple things. I know. I know it's late, but that's why I wrote 8:15, not 8 o'clock. <laughs> Sneaky. Okay. 
Okay, this is uh, housekeeping things. Uh, Stephanie is passing out feedback forms. You know we work off of your feedback all the time. In fact, that's one of the reasons why this continues to come back. So please, we need your feedback. Uh, take a look at the maps again and, and make the corrections. These are working maps. We want to update our records. Remember, we have our meetings coming up for brand, brand new block leaders as well as appreciation, so I'll be sending out information about that. Please remember your name tags. They're valuable to us. If you would drop them off at the table. And, um, and finally, before I say thank you, thank you again, please help us clean up. We, we really, really appreciate that you take the time to do so with the receptacles in the back. The deputies are going to be hanging around here. Ken Erickson will be here as well. So ask questions. And thank you again for coming. <laughs>